Kia ora koutou, ko Nati Ozi te iwi, ko Nati Pakeha te iwi, ko Qantas 747 SP Tawaka, ko Duncan Babbage Takungo. This is how I'd introduce myself in New Zealand. It's called a mihi mihi, which means an introduction where I talk about where I'm from, my tribal background, the canoe that brought me to New Zealand, and my name. And so I say that I am from the tribe of the Aussies and from the tribe of the Pakeha New Zealanders. Uh, that I came to New Zealand on a Qantas 747 SP uh, back in 1981 and that my name is Duncan Babbage. My professional background is as a recovering clinical psychologist. I trained in general psychology and then specialised in clinical psychology and I worked in child adolescent mental health and in adult mental health and in psychogeriatric services but I went on particularly to focus on a neuro rehabilitation, uh, rehabilitation after severe brain injuries and I worked in that area in the public health system in New Zealand and also in the NHS in the UK. I guess the largest employer I ever worked for with 1.2 million employees because I don't think the Chinese Red Army is looking for anyone with my skill set at present. Uh, but I've been drifting over time into uh, technology. I started out supervising some graduate students who are doing research looking at applying technology and brain injury and along the way I started doing iOS development myself and now I am both doing active coding in the research projects we're doing in the Centre for eHealth that I head up at Auckland University of Technology and also I have a, a startup uh, with an app that I'll show you as well which I've been working on. And so along the way I've kind of come from these two worlds that I'm bringing together of software development and of understanding human psychology and particularly working with people with neurological impairment. And it's made me uh, think about a few things to do with the way our brains function and the way we develop our software, the way that that software can help people who are having neurodisability but also the things that we might need to do to make that software as accessible as possible. I mean, one of the interesting things with the supercomputers that we now carry around in our pocket is that there is great potential to address impairment and reduce disability because disability is not inherent in impairment, it's about the extent to which society causes a person to be disabled by not enabling them to fully participate in valued life roles due to their impairments. And so technology can be something that reduces disability, but because technology is creating new areas of human functioning, new things that we anticipate doing as a normal part of our life's activities, if we don't make that technology accessible, we actually are creating new disabilities that didn't previously exist. Because the person's impairment hasn't changed, but there are now larger areas of life that their peers are engaging in, which they cannot access. Disability is not an inevitable result of impairment, we create it as a disabling society when we don't enable someone to fully participate. And that's why cognitive accessibility is so important for so many people, because actually neurological impairment and changes in neurological functioning and the ageing process are both extremely common rather than the exception. They're going to affect many people we know and care about. God forbid any of you would ever need to access my services, is the way I usually describe it. Uh, but if you did, you want to be able to do as much as possible with the technologies that we like. So I'm going to talk about a couple of um, areas of cognitive functioning. And some of the ways in which cognition is impaired after brain injury or a neurological impairment and, and what we might be able to do to help with some of those things in our software design. And so one really common area is impairment and attention functioning. People often um, think of memory difficulties as something that's common after brain injury and that's true. Actually quite a lot of memory functioning is due to impairment and attention. The ability to selectively pay attention, to divide attention, to deal with competing attentional demands and distractions is, is really important. And so there's some important things we need to consider in terms of what we do with our software design as well. Another area is memory functioning and making assumptions about users' memory capacities is going to make a big difference to who is able to access the, the tools that we build. And certainly there are other areas too like visual perception and the ability to actually understand things in the same way that an average user might which can be affected. 
And, and there are many other areas as well. And a lot of it comes down to a person's ability to take the building blocks of basic human behavior and put them together to achieve the outcomes that they mean to, what we call executive functioning. And so anything that enhances simplicity, that makes something easier to understand and engage with, is very good for cognitive accessibility. And I think we kind of know that. And so the main way in which we try and make tools accessible for people, regardless of the level of cognitive functioning, is by keeping them as clean and simple as possible. And this is a good thing to do. Uh, and no designer in the room is likely to disagree with the idea that clean and simple is a good idea anyway. Do we have any designers in the room? UX designers or other designers? Most people are software developers, is that right? Yeah. So clean and simple is all very well and good. It's a good objective, but I think the problem is that it really is just one size fits all. And if you, like me, are almost two meters tall and have an abnormally long arm span for your height, you will know one size fits all is a lie, a bloody lie, <laughs> uh, a reason why I hate to go shopping. Fortunately, thanks to online web services now, I can just dial up custom-made clothing that actually fits me. Now, it's funny that we treat cognitive accessibility as just a one-size-fits-all issue and don't really go any further. Uh, really, when you go looking for people who've written about this issue, there's, there's, there's some scholarship and some practical work that's been done around cognitive accessibility for the World Wide Web, essentially nothing in mobile software. Most of it just comes down to saying, how do we make things not too complicated? And yet in other areas of accessibility, we've adopted much more flexible frameworks. And this is one you'll be familiar with. We know that when we build our apps, we need to make sure that they respond to changes in text size. And the, the midpoint, I almost labeled this the default. Uh, I think of this as the default, because that's about the biggest I ever set my text. I think that's where it might start. But even now, when you upgrade iOS, it asks you, you know, would you rather have a slightly zoomed in interface or a slightly less zoomed in interface? And it's not presented as an accessibility option. And I've been fascinated to see colleagues who have a much larger text size set than me and don't think of it as an accessibility issue at all. And of course, we know that apps can scale quite nicely like this. And then there's that switch that you can turn on, which is called the ruin all my hopes and dreams of getting home for the weekend slider. And then the, uh, the type size can get really large. Now, what I think is most interesting about this is that Apple shipped it. Right? Apple, who are famed for their um, you know, desire to have tight control over their interfaces and for wanting things to look really nice and tidy, were willing to let that switch get bumped all the way over there, and you can't even see the help text on a single screen anymore without scrolling. Because they recognize that for some people, this is the only way that the interface is going to be accessible, and it's worth making some significant compromises in order to let a person be able to achieve what they want to with the tool. So what does that mean for cognitive accessibility then? I think that we need to move on from one size fits all. And I guess the question is, how do we go about it? I think at the very least, we want to think about the possibility that we need a few options like those type sizes. Maybe not as many options on that slider, but at least something that goes from, I want something more simple. I want something that you regard as the standard. And then I want maybe an expert mode. Now we've only just met, and so I don't want to offend you by immediately kind of coming to any judgment, but based on what I know, I think your app is probably somewhere about over here at the moment in terms of where the complexity slider might sit. And actually, the more I talk to people about how you would need to design software to be useful for people with brain injury, the more I think that starting with the idea of a user with brain injury is probably a better way to design an app for the general population. Because our assumptions about the complexity that a standard user actually wants to deal with are fairly flawed anyway, because we don't have the same attentional problems that other people do. You know, when you look at a screen, you know exactly what you are supposed to be looking at. And so it's very hard to be confused in the way that my parents are, even though they have used 
the technology that they use for decades now, they're avid upgraders of their laptops and their, my mother's iPhone, but still the complexity for them means that they don't look at the right part of the screen. There's too much going on in even what we think of as a clean design and they get confused. So how can we do this? Well, three ideas that I'm going to give you today, uh, one of which is more practically worked through in terms of how you might implement this for things to consider uh, in terms of designing and building for better cognitive accessibility. And the first one is to try and reduce the task demands. So this is a screenshot from an iOS app that I developed at the Centre Free Health uh, and which we built in partnership with a brain injury rehabilitation service called ABI Rehabilitation in Auckland who provide 80% of the uh, post-acute, once you're medically stable, if you're in the North Island or the Upper South Island, you go to one of their facilities in Auckland or Wellington until you're ready to be cared for in the community. So these people are two to four weeks post severe brain injury, most of them from motor vehicle accidents and they are receiving intensive rehabilitation. Now some of the key symptoms that someone has in that situation are that they're confused, they have memory difficulties, and they have a neurologically based lack of awareness of their difficulties. So even in the presence of very substantial and obvious impairment that anyone could see in the person's functioning, they are unaware that they are impaired. And so, because the brain is all about making sense of your world, if you think you're fine, then you want to go home. I don't need to be here, I should just get out of here. And after an hour conversation with a physiotherapist or a speech and language therapist, the person might have grasped, ah, oh, I see what we're doing here, but it very quickly is gone and the rest of the day when they're needing to rest or do more routine activities just as part of their overall rehabilitation. So we built with them this video portal which is installed on the client bedrooms in a number of test clients' rooms where they could watch as often as they liked uh, videos of themselves and their clinicians talking about why they're in rehabilitation to reinforce the positive messages to tie it to the areas in which this service sets goals and tied to good rehabilitation goal setting philosophy. Now that's the app, I don't actually have time to talk about the rest of the app. Uh, it's not in the app store yet but we're going to be trialling it further and I have some meetings uh, actually this afternoon to talk about a, a Victoria based trial of some of this as well. But one of the things that we were interested in was the authentication stage of this process. How do we take someone who ha probably has no recollection necessarily that we've even put this iPad in their room or what the software is for and may not be able to recall a password or a PIN number or something like that and doesn't recall any training of the device. And so, you know, we could have a PIN number login and we did build this, but we thought, can't we do something a little bit more sophisticated? How could we reduce the cognitive demands? And so what we decided to do was compromise. Compromise on the um, sophistication in some ways of our security arrangements in favour of something that might be more practical for these clients. And so we got them Xiaomi MyBand 2 wristbands, the cheapest Bluetooth wristband I could find that had a clock on it. So that way if someone finds this on their wrist and they wonder what the hell is this thing doing here, it at least tells them the time and they go, oh, I've got to be at my physiotherapy appointment. That worked really well with all the clients we gave them to, except the one client where we accidentally didn't set the wristband up properly before we issued it. And for a whole week, he had a wristband that gave him a time that was two hours out from his actual time zone, which didn't go down that well with the therapists who were trying to orient him. Now, if you're wearing this wristband and doing nothing at all, once you get within three metres of the device, it automatically recognises the person based on the Bluetooth ID that's been given off by the device, and it puts their photograph on the screen and it welcomes them. Now this is not one of their clients, this is one of the clients I have at home when I go home from work for the day. Uh, also challenging, though not due to actual brain injury, although sometimes, you know, as a parent you feel uh, <laughs> there but the grace of God go I in so many possible directions. Three metres away, uh, Surf and I gets welcomed, right? He would be the first to tell you he's 10 now. Uh, and then when you get within one metre of the device, it would automatically log the person in and start playing them the first screen, which actually this is the second screen. The first screen is a, a text-based screen that explains what the portal is about and it reads it out uh, as well in audio by default, although that can be changed by the clinical team. So here, all we're trying to do is say, why does a person need to remember how to use this app. We always wanted to just build it to be as intuitive as possible, assuming that 
a person wouldn't remember their training. The, whole, the holy grail for a cognitive prosthetic is you use it right the first time with no training, because that means even if you forget all your training, you still use it correctly. And, and people uh, found this tool easy to use. We co-designed it with their clinicians and their clients, but the authentication mechanism, we wanted it to be as brainless as possible. Now, it might sound familiar to you. This actually sounds a little bit like a mechanism that Apple have built into this device on my other wrist. And so I just wanted to point out for historical purposes, we're not claiming we invented anything super new, but we started building this in 2014, and Apple announced uh, the Apple Watch unlocking the Mac in 2016 with Mac OS Sierra. And of course, Sierra hasn't, um, you know, that capability hasn't even come to the iPad yet. Now, to be fair, their security is much more impressive than ours on the Bluetooth wristbands. You know, if we had more time to talk on this project, I'd be talking about the trade-offs we made in terms of thinking about ways in which that security could be overcome, uh, but not getting too concerned when it's in the patient bedroom in a secure facility uh, with a person who's being well looked after because they're vulnerable anyway, and where someone could just come and watch them type a PIN number and to log in if they didn't have the Bluetooth wristband. So, you know, we, we felt we were quite comfortable and so was the clinical service. I referred to this as misusing Bluetooth, and here's my code that proves it. Uh, if you haven't used these frameworks before, one of the things that you can get from the Core Bluetooth Central Manager is an RSSI value that is thrown off by Bluetooth devices, uh, and we were able to, that gives you a signal strength indicator. It's not possible to actually turn that into a physical distance in any uh, reliable, mathematically reliable way, but it is possible to turn it into a physical distance in a practically reliable way. So if you've calibrated it for the general type of environment in which you're using it, we can make a good prediction on what's about three meters and what's about one meter, and we didn't care if we were off by a few centimeters. We weren't trying to make measurements, we were trying to make decisions. And so that worked just fine with a bit of, you know, practical testing of the signal strength drop off, the amount of bounce that we're getting off walls that, you know, increases the apparent strength and things. So we had a simple way of determining if you were uh, above a threshold. We dealt with the variability in it by just taking a, a rolling average that had to get to a certain level over time rather than just firing off a signal high value, uh, a high signal value, which made an enormous difference to the reliability of a technique like this, and it worked pretty well. We also found, uh, in terms of user testing, that these quite severe clients with brain injuries uh, in fact, we're able to remember new PIN numbers, which really surprised us and their clinical teams. And so some of them just logged in with a PIN number anyway. If there was any problem with their Bluetooth wristband or if they just had left it somewhere, uh, and that, that was an interesting observation which, you know, it's fair to share. Uh, they also were much more insightful than anyone expected about some of the failings in their clinical teams where they were able to tell us in in-depth qualitative interviews at the end of, you know, one to three to four months of using the system about the ways their clinicians hadn't engaged with the platform as actively as they would like, which we were able to validate with quantitative data and the archived videos we had as well. So that was very interesting. Uh, I'm not saying that these clients didn't have significant cognitive impairment, but uh, it really shows the value of in-depth discussions with your end users, as we all know. Okay, another example, just a brief one. Idea two, build for the brain. I mean, one of the ways in which we can make technologies more cognitively accessible is actually trying to take research about brain injury and about neurological functioning and consider what that means for how we build our apps. I think this is probably a, a less useful idea to most people, but I wanted to highlight it because uh, I think it has some value. Uh, in particular, I've tried to do this in an app that I shipped to the App Store, an elite startup team of one, just me, uh, working in some spare time. Uh, please be kind as you, as you give me robust feedback on, on this tool. Uh, so the purpose of this app is to scratch an itch that is a very deeply held personal one I have, which is I'm absolutely terrible at learning people's names and remembering faces. And I started doing some research with a doctoral student where we were looking at building a mobile app for people with brain injury to address this issue where you could create links between people uh, and you could also uh, look people up based on physical characteristics and a range of other things locating people by um, you know geofencing and so on and what I kept hearing was feedback from the general population saying oh look I have a terrible problem with this as well from a surprisingly high number of people what I realized in the end was it's not that these people are impaired it's that as humans we're not actually 
wired to cope with meeting as many people as we do in our day-to-day -day lives these days. That actually, you know, there's that number, 135 or 150, that historically in your entire life you'd only meet about 135 people. And so for many of us, that's about as good as we can remember. And if you're in a job like me where you meet literally thousands of people every year, you're in overload conditions. But often what you just need is just a few more opportunities to learn and practice someone's name than the normal environment gives you and it would actually stick. It's not that you're incapable of learning people's names, it's that the real world doesn't give you quite as much input as you need and you get into that horrible situation where you've said, hey, how you doing, with no name so often now that it's actually difficult to go back. I need to click one more time. And to help you learn names and recognise faces. John Gruber. Initially, the tool shows you both a person's picture and their name. Look at the person's face while you practice the name. Lauren Good. If you practice the name correctly, tap Named Correctly. David Pogue. Lauren Good. Once you've named a person correctly a few times, they'll appear with their name hidden. Don't guess a name, even in your head. If you're not sure, tap Show Me to check. If you then say their name correctly, that still counts as correct. John Gruber. Veronica Maduna. Each session, the first few people soon reappear. Lauren Good. The more times you get a person's name right, the longer it will be before you see them again. Alok Jahar. When you have problems like me in learning names, but then use this tool to practice, it's amazing to find people's names just popping into your head. Federico Petici. Happy learning. So obviously you have to load people into the app and add photographs of them before you can use Intro's Learn tool to actually learn their names. So for some people that's going to be easier to do than others. What I found though is that there's a lot of apps on the App Store that have tried to use quizzes or something like that to learn people's names in the past. And as a clinical neuropsychologist by background, I knew that they were rubbish and they were never going to work. It wasn't about the app development, it's that the principles underlying it either weren't going to help you or actually activated the very mechanisms that help people to encode errors and fail to retrieve the correct information. So this learn tool is based on two principles from neuropsychology called errorless learning and spaced retrieval. And they very powerfully help you to create a groove that means that you actually remember the information that you were planning to recall in the first place. Now there's nothing technologically particularly sophisticated about this, but actually in terms of learning people's names, it's an effective approach. So sometimes we might be able to make our apps more cognitively accessible by broadening our multidisciplinary team and thinking about who needs to contribute to our design and our architecture. How about something a little bit more practical though? So let's provide some options for people in our app design. And this is something that I think can potentially apply to any app. So I suggested earlier, you know, some people want something that's more simple. Some people want something that is standard. And for some people, they really want to be able to get their teeth into an expert interface. So what if we actually made this a setting in our app that we let someone be able to dial up what they would like to experience? Would you like it to be simple? Do you want the standard interface or do you want an expert interface? And then scale the entire app to deliver that degree of complexity to them in the same way that we would scale text sizes. Now some of you I can see are thinking, that's amazing. He has just described out loud the nightmare that has no name. I talked once at a conference about some of these ideas around cognitive accessibility without an implementation and the first question at the end of the presentation in Auckland was from a UX designer who said, I just hope to God that none of my clients are in the room today to hear you say this. Because how would you go about implementing it? And so that was a few, quite a few years ago and I've been thinking about that since and I have a couple of suggestions that I think at least make it practical. So what would this look like if we actually implement it? I would suggest that I'm serious about that arrow being further up here towards expert, that I think that when we're building one size fits all, we actually have to make some very difficult trade-offs and decisions about what should be in this app. 
because you're torn between trying to make something simple and straightforward that delivers the core experience and delivering the tools that you know a more sophisticated user would want. And sometimes we'll have a large set of settings where people can turn on a few extra, you know, kind of power user tools. But, you know, getting more and more settings also doesn't feel like a simple or a positive user experience, particularly for a person who would never want any of those more sophisticated options and feel some responsibility to understand what's in the settings to make those decisions. And so if you actually freed yourself from having to design for one size fits all, you could actually have your core standard experience be something that is more streamlined because you've got somewhere to put all those other features that the team agrees these need to be in the app, but maybe they don't have to be part of the default experience or, or maybe you don't have a default experience and you give people all three options to start with and they choose. And then thirdly, I'm arguing that we want a simple version. A version of your app where you say, we are going to give up major parts of our functionality. Substantial entire features and elements of our tool are going to completely disappear when we decide for someone who can't handle the app the way it is normally, what would be the most important parts of the experience that it would be valuable to give them access to since because of those attention problems, the memory difficulties, the ability to handle complexity, if we gave them access to everything, they wouldn't have access to anything. But by giving them a limited set of elements, maybe they could do something. So I thought, well, I'll try and apply this to intro. Here's a tool that I've built myself so I know what's in it and I've got access to the code base. What would happen if I took this approach and tried to apply it to the home screen, the main menu of the app, and, uh, and then actually implement it in terms of the code. So here's the current home screen. If you haven't yet started a free trial or unlocked the Pro Tools, so there's also the padlock in the top corner. And it's a pretty straightforward layout. And I said, what would I do if I wanted to make that expert version of the tool and I wanted to make the simple version? And it ended up looking something like this. When it came to the simple version of the tool, I thought, you know, which are the parts of this that the person definitely needs access to? And I felt that the, they needed to be able to add new people to the app, that the learn tool was one of the most core parts of the experience. They could forego some of the things that aren't even accessible directly from the main menu, like making dated notes that are attached to contacts and, and you know, recording biographical information about people, maybe even omitting the ability to make links between people. So each person would just stand as their own in the app. But they needed to be able to add people. They should be able to use that learn tool and there needed to be some way that they could actually find people. But rather than having bookmarks and search, I'd get rid of bookmarks and we'd just have a simplified search interface. I also felt, when I was thinking about it, that search maybe wasn't the right word either. So we'll come back to that a bit later. Now, expert was interesting because when it came to an expert user, normally I would expect that what we'd be adding is more features, things that they would be able to do that other people wouldn't want to. But when it came to this main menu at least, what I found was that I felt like I was able to take some things out that in fact an expert user probably didn't want access to the help text from the main menu of the app because they either knew how to use it already or they'd be able to go and find it in a subsection like link through settings or something like that. And I also thought probably an expert wouldn't tap on something labeled support. Now, they might need support, but someone who considered themselves an expert user probably wouldn't ask for it. Uh, and so rather than activating the, the, the chat interface here, which uh, is through smooch.io, which lets them directly chat to our team, uh, that'd be me, uh, and it comes into my end Slack where I can reply back to them directly in app, so it's like a private iMessage channel within the app. Uh, for an expert user, they get exactly the same service, but it's labeled feedback rather than support. Well, it turned out this was actually surprisingly simple to implement and not in a way that is disastrous or led to my view controllers being even larger. So what did I do? Well, here's the overall structure and then I'm going to work through the implementation over the next 10 minutes. First of all, we need that setting, a simplicity setting. And let's say it could be simple, standard or expert like I've talked about. And then we want that to flow on in some way to a set of features that each of those settings should define or, or be used to define features that a person should be given access to. 
From those features, we need some way to map those features to specific parts of our view in this part of the application, and then we need a way to turn those views on or off, depending on what a user wants. Now, this is just one way to implement this, and it no doubt has some flaws, uh, but it at least is fairly clean, and it is loosely coupled so that you can change any level of the system without the other parts of it needing to be altered, and it turned out to be quite straightforward. Well, for toggling the views, in this case, I didn't do anything other than just set is hidden on the ones that I didn't want anymore. Uh, and that was extremely straightforward. The app already uses auto layout. This is actually a, a couple of stack views, uh, one for the main buttons and another one embedded at the bottom here, which is a horizontal stack view as well. Uh, the stack view was, uh, the, the bottom section here had a fixed height already. The rest were automatically spread and then there's you know, clearance from the, uh, from the safe area at the top. And I discovered that all I had to do was implement a series of toggles to turn on and off these views and I could turn on and off every single one of these views individually, nothing broke. You could go right down to literally every single element on the screen being gone, and the app still laid out as well as you would expect for something that now has zero views uh, associated with it. But actually, it was surprisingly painless. Toggling those things on and off worked just fine. Now, admittedly, I started with having correctly implemented auto layout, and I think UI stack views are really good for something like this, and it's yet another reason to use them. Uh, but I think this is a really important part of implementing an idea like this, is that it becomes very easy to build your views and your view controllers in a way that they can say, you know, just you tell me and I can turn on and off whatever you need me to. How then do we map these features to the views? Well, that's a job for the view controller. And what I did was I defined a local features option set, right? So, uh, simply labeling each of the possible uh, features that existed on the screen uh, using this option set approach, which, you know, as you may know, is just basically a whole series of balls in a sense, but they are combined together in a single value where you can turn one or more of them on or off and you can create sets of them. And so I, as well as labeling those main buttons, also labeled the other interface elements here. Uh, and then also a couple of features here. Label search is find, label support is feedback. We could debate the merits of this way of doing this, uh, but that's what I did initially. Uh, and then created a set of these, all features, uh, which just contains all of these things, uh, except for these um, alternative ways of labeling the element. And so then, toggling on and off the views in this using this local features actually becomes extremely simple. You see, private var on the um, UI view controller, uh, which by default is set to all features, so it just displays like it would have in the past. Uh, but, and then on view did load, it calls configure features. And so configure features simply says, for each one of these views, uh, if local features doesn't contain bookmarks, then hide bookmarks. If local features doesn't contain search, then hide search, and so on. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one mapping, so in the case of the local feature hints, there were four views there, four different hints on that view that would be hidden if uh, the local features didn't have hints turned on. Uh, so with that expert mode, I realized I could turn off the hints. You remember on that initial screen, uh, the, the text, the subtext that was under each of the buttons, which meant that the expert mode actually looked simpler than the standard mode because they didn't need as much help going along the way. And then I simply just relabeled a couple of locations as well. Of course, this would be localized. Um, there is more than one way you could achieve this, but I simply said, if label search is finders in the local features, then uh, set the search label text. Okay, so we've got a way to turn on and off the views, and there is a single value uh, that is held by the view controller, and it just takes what has been put into that value, and it turns on and off the necessary views in order to show and hide the features that you want to be displayed. So how do we define these feature sets? Well, initially I implemented the feature sets as well on the view controller. You might want to put this in a presenter, and I'll come back to the idea of even surfacing that further up the chain later. But it's very simple. You just say, well, I'm going to create three sets of local features here. I'm going to create a, a version for simple, a version for standard, and a version for expert. And I'm going to say which items I want to appear uh, if you are having the simple version of this interface, if you're having the standard version of this interface, or if you're having the expert version of this interface. 
Now this is not abstracted code, this is literally all of the code that I had to implement in order to achieve the outcome that I showed you with the three different main menus. There was nothing extra apart from creating a couple of outlets for views that I didn't actually hold any reference to explicitly in the view controller previously, so that I could set that as hidden flag. Apart from that, it's the code you've seen here. And then that simplicity setting. Well, we have a protocol for that. So we just define an enum, simple standard or expert, and then a protocol, simplicity responsive, that says, hey, if you're simplicity responsive, you have to have a var called simplicity, which takes a simplicity value. I want to let you know about it. And then when you conform to the protocol, you say, hey, if anyone sets my simplicity value to something different, then you need to do, then I'm going to do two things. I'm going to select my local features, and then I'm going to configure the features. And you can see here, it's extremely simple. If the case is simple, then take my local feature set that's simple, if it's standard, standard, and if it's expert, expert. Now, there's a couple of more sophisticated ways you could do this too, but that's all that's needed. So what do we have? At the top level of your app, you set a simplicity setting, and it can be simple, standard, or expert, and it doesn't need to know about anything else. But by defining feature sets that say, at the appropriate level in your hierarchy, whether that's your presenter or directly in your view controller, this is the set of features that would be standard, or this is the set of features that a, a simpler version of the interface would need, uh, you can um, very clearly and declaratively say, this is what I want the app to look like. And it's completely loosely coupled from the actual implementation of that. But within the view controller, all you have to have is a view controller that lays things out well with auto layout and that just listens to that uh, local features value and says, yep, whatever you tell me are the features you need, I will present them to the user. And you've got the entire thing implemented. It literally only took me a very short period of time and I was making it up from the start rather than with an existing pattern. Now there's certainly some more sophisticated things you could think about. Because having features defined locally would make sense in some context. And there are going to be some aspects of the interface that you're going to just want to take that simplicity value and go, well, if it's simple, then you know, hide these things locally that are very specific to this view controller. But there might be whole features in your app that you say, well, actually, I want bookmarks to just disappear throughout the entire app interface. And so I'm going to define some core global features of the app that are not about specific view controllers, but rather are things like bookmarks access to the learn tool, the ability to link people together. And I'm actually going to set those in a global option set that's going to be passed to the same location through dependency injection that creates the local feature set. So that for those local bookmarks features, it will say, I'll oh, just take the global value and I'll pass on whatever it is. So that way you only set it in one location in your app. And of course, as you can see, having done that, Nothing else in this implementation needs to even know that you've implemented global features. So if at some point you decide to turn something into a global feature setting, uh, you don't have to tell any of the rest of the implementation that you've even done this. So, simple, only the most important features. A standard approach that gives you the main features and control, and then an expert mode that gives you maximum features and all controls. You can actually start to divide out Quite simply, in terms of the implementation, uh, three quite different versions of your app for your users that give them the kind of experience that they want. And someone may want this simple experience, even if they're not cognitively impaired, because it, they just enjoy it more. And so they may be more engaged. It turns out this is not a difficult programming task. It may, however, be a freaking nightmare for your designer. Because when you actually start to think, not about how you implement the design with things like auto layout, but what actually are the core features of our app? What is the UX that we want to give people as the standard experience versus a simplified experience? Or, you know, uh, when we're thinking about a, a search controller, should I allow a person to search across different domains? Or when it's a simplified experience, should we just say, well, you can only search for certain types of content? These actually become very difficult, philosophical, uh, pragmatic, UX decisions that are to do with your users, what they really want, and what we want to deliver to them. Now those are challenging questions, but they're actually really important ones. And they're the kinds of questions that we always are grappling with anyway when it comes to what's a good experience and what's the app I want to build. In some ways, this makes some of those decisions easier because you don't have to come to a single endpoint of saying, well, this is the one compromise that we've agreed is the right thing to put in the app. You actually get three choices. So, you know, when uh, 
someone who's more likely to be named Bob than Jamila wants a particularly complicated feature for the users, you can say, well, okay, we'll have that, but it's going to sit in expert mode and it's not going to be part of the standard package. Really interested in your feedback. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, very happy to hear feedback now or uh, uh, via the Twitters later on. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.